Hey everyone, welcome to the Roundtable with Vienna White, Season 1, Episode 67. I'm your host, Millie Rouge from the band Vienna White from Edmonton, Canada. This Roundtable is a Yegg Music production. I'd like to introduce you to my co-host on my left here today, Marissa Kay, who makes up the other half of our band, Vienna White. How's your day going so far, Marissa? Oh, it's going good. I got my <laughs> coffee and now I have a glass full of water because I'm trying to be responsible. <laughs> trying to be an adult. I love it. Awesome. So I want to introduce our other guests, of course, that are here with us today. On my right is Michelle Lau, who is from Toronto, Ontario, Canada represent. Thank you for being here today. Uh, We have Camila Arcu, who is from London in the UK. And we have Nicole, oh, I guess I should go in order, Daunton Negrin from New York City. And our last guest on the very bottom left is Nicole Reynolds. So thank you everyone so, so much for coming today. Uh, We really appreciate having you on. And we're excited because me and Marissa like she mentioned earlier we're both piano players ourselves. I'm probably definitely like the most beginner out of all of you I would say (laughs) but I still love the piano so I'm really excited to to hear your guys's kind of opinions and thoughts on the instrument. So without that being kind of further said let's just quickly jump into talking about all of our individual journeys so that our audience can kind of know a little bit more about where your background stands with music and a little bit more about what you do. Um, So I want to start with Nicole. Can you kind of just start us off with what your musical journey has been like, kind of where you started from and maybe where you are today with your music journey? Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nicole. Uh, Firstly, thank you so much for having me here, girls. It's an absolute pleasure to be asked. Um, I just kind of fell into piano because a friend of the family was teaching and um, I'm not really very good at anything else. And that was the thing I was good at. So kept going with that one. And uh, when I was 17, I just started playing in like restaurants and piano bars. Um, 21, I went to London College of Music and studied music composition. Um, And since then, I kind of fell into the hotel performances. So I was mainly at the high end, very nice hotels like the Savoy and the Dorchester. I played at Harrods quite a bit too. So playing the kind of easy listening background music for the afternoon tea. Um, that's kind of what I'm, where I'm at at the moment. So I'm specializing in that and, and wedding music as well. So mm. I guess it's the twinkly pretty stuff that is kind of my sort of thing. I'm not that great at the <laughs> classical, but if you want a Justin Bieber arrangement, then I'm all about that. So <laughs> that's me. That's amazing. <laughs> and you as well, Nicole, you're in a duo as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm in a brand new, a very new duo, actually. Um, just started as we went into lockdown, typical. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chelsea and Nicole duo. Um, I work with her at weddings and events and stuff. She's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I love playing for singers because it's a whole other style of playing. I'm sure you guys as pianists will agree accompanying is is so different to solo mm-hmm. piano. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, now, Doton, can you kind of tell us a bit more about your journey and what you do as a musician? Sure. So I, uh, I started off as an actor, actually, back in high school, uh, doing theater. Um, and I went to college for theater as well. But uh, all my roommates in college were musicians. Mm. And that's kind of how I got into jazz music. And from there, I just became, I just fell in love with jazz. I, I fell in love with the, um, the way musicians are able to communicate without any words at all and, and to really make you feel something without words. Um, and that's how I kind of jumped into learning piano. Um, I started off playing at 19 years old um, and I just kind of went with it. And, and um, eventually I got out of college and, and became very frustrated with you know, getting a real job and getting into real estate and, and doing a bunch of random things that eventually I decided, you know what? you know, what if I could live my life doing the things that I love every single day? And that was, you know, I want to play music. I want to travel the world. I want to experience the world. And um, what I ended up deciding to to do was I started playing my piano on the street in New York. And what happened was I started meeting a lot of really amazing people, people from all over the world, (laughs) travelers. And from there, I just fell in love with that, that process of discovery, that process of meeting new people and, Mm -hmm going with the flow and flying with the wind. So at around 22, 23 years old, I, uh, I took all my savings and I bought this truck. Um, I put some carpeting, I made it look nice. I loaded up my piano and I just started traveling the world with a 500 pound upright piano. Oh my gosh. Um, gosh. Which was crazy. <laughs> kind of silly at times. <laughs> I still to this day look back, I'm like, why, why would anyone do this? This is ridiculous. This is crazy. Um, 
it was fun. It, it was, you know, I was, I was uh, really chasing the thrill, really chasing the adventure and discovery. And like, I, I look back now and I realize, like I, at 21, 22, I, I had not really ever experienced the world. Mm-hmm. And this experience just showed me everything. It showed me all different types of people. And, and literally every city I would go to, I would meet people. People would invite me over to their houses for dinner and, and meet their families and stuff like that. And, um, so yeah, that, that, I've been doing that since 2011. It's 2020 now. Mm-hmm. That's um, such a cool journey. That's so amazing to hear. And I'm, I'm so impressed that you lugged a piano that large everywhere you went, not just an electric keyboard, just a huge piano. That's props goes to you. <laughs> yeah, there's something, there's something really, you know, I, I play keyboards and there's mm-hmm. something that's missing it's not it doesn't have this living feeling to it that's ever changing it's, yeah you know, very static it sounds like a static note versus a, a real piano which one is super impressive when people are like oh how did you get this piano here and two it's just the sound and the emotive quality of it is really much more dynamic i find and that's why that's why i, did, I use the upright absolutely really cool yeah i love to hear that um, so Carmilla, I want to hear more about your musical journey. And I know I was doing some research in, even about the shirt that you're wearing right now. Um, so I'd love to kind of learn more about what oh. you do, but I think I lost her. Oh no, we lost her. <laughs> she got oh, so no. excited that she just left. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Well, um, let's jump to Michelle. And then when Carmilla yeah. comes back, we'll <laughs> jump back in. So Michelle, I want to hear more about, uh, you being a fellow Canadian as well. I kind of want to hear more about your musical journey on kind of the other side of Canada and what you do with your piano well I started um, piano when I was about like seven seven and a half as most Asian kids do we do like the, the violin and the piano or both and um, you're in Canada so you probably also know about the RCM system mm-hmm. so Royal Conservatory of Music is uh, still very like classical music based so I'm a classical pianist started when I was seven and a half and then um, really fell in love with it when I was in high school mm-hmm. and then ended up getting my undergrad and my master's at the University of Western Ontario in classical piano performing. And then um, during my years there, I uh, got injured. And so that's when I found uh, about performance psychology and medicine. So then I started a, like a small YouTube channel called The Open Score to kind of address those things because I found at least in the classical musical world, um being injured is a little bit like a taboo to talk about it's gotten better now I think but um it can be like a very isolating experience as a musician if you're injured and then you can't talk to any about it and then your doctors are like well you can just stop playing your instrument and you're like not really no. but okay <laughs> yeah so I started that a little bit and then um I wanted to do a lot of other projects like Uh, start a YouTube channel with other classical musicians Mm. and then we can kind of like nerd over classical stuff together (laughs) so thankfully with uh, COVID uh, all of us had to have you know like gear like cameras and stuff to learn how to stream teach online right so uh, all my friends that I had back in university I got them all gathered together so I recently started a YouTube channel called two sharps one flat and we just like nerd over classical music basically that's so cool and um I am basically, I teach piano mainly, but I also do a little bit of performing and accompanying uh, here and there. That's incredible. I love, I love that you mentioned the, and we're actually going to talk about kind of some injury prevention techniques, but that's definitely something that's mm-hmm. a little bit taboo for sure. Um, so I'm glad yes. you mentioned that. Now, Carmilla, we have you back in the conversation. Welcome yes. back. <laughs> Really quick, uh, Millie, just make sure you change yeah. the title on uh, Twitch yeah, before we get into I'm that, before I forget. I'm sure I did, but... Uh... Okay, yeah, sweet. anyhow. Um, um, yes, so Camilla, yeah. we're, you're back. Yay. <laughs> yes, apologies. So sorry. That's Thank okay. Thank you so much for having, having me on. Um, so my musical journey, um, I started the piano when I was five. Um, I think I quit for a year when I was six. I just decided I'm sick of it for a year. But then after that, that, that was kind of it for me. Um, so I, I went on to study music and French at Yale. And then after my undergraduate, I went to the UK for my master's and studied at the Royal Northern College of Music. Um, Since then, I've been performing and teaching. Um, I think recently the most exciting thing for me has been finding a way to channel some of my other interests into my performances and Mm -hmm. piano career. Um, So I'm very passionate about social issues, uh, diversity in music, representation, um, so in my performing, I've increasingly moved towards new music, um, 
music by composers of color, music by women, and yeah, tried to find a way to celebrate all the amazing composers that don't get attention in classical music. Mm -hmm. um, even though I think that's changing now, which is very exciting. Um, another one of my projects is a nonprofit that I founded in 2008 called Music for Liberia. And that is very much inspired by my heritage. So I'm half Liberian, half Norwegian. I was born in Switzerland, I grew up in the States, and now I live in London. Um, so I've taken all my experiences and kind of poured them into my charity. Uh, we support children and education in Liberia, which is a small country in West Africa with a very traumatic recent history. Um, and we do that through music events. So we organize concerts, we work with artists from all different fields, all different styles and backgrounds, and all proceeds from our events go towards children in Liberia. So that's been one of the things I'm most passionate about in the past couple of years, and it's a great way to use music to do some good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Look at that, us. Like, it's, it's so cool <laughs> that we have, and like you talk about diversity in music and like just even hearing all of your guys' backgrounds, and mm -hmm. I mean, mine and Millie's backgrounds are also very different. So it's, I'm very excited about this conversation. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> So uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, we're going to get into some uh, some questions here mm -hmm. uh, about kind of our topic of the day. So Millie, what's our topic of yeah, the day? Yeah, so our topic of the day is the life of a pianist or a penis, as people say, however you say it. Um, but I want to, I just have some questions. We've kind of brainstormed some questions that kind of are, we have some like, would you rather questions, some um, just questions about your experience as a piano player. Um, so again, like we said, anyone feel free to chime in whenever you feel comfortable. Um, but what drew you into liking this instrument over compared to other instruments that maybe you considered playing? What was kind of that um, thing that brought you into wanting to play the piano? <laughs> uh, I'll say the music <laughs> I think I mean for me the piano just has the best music and the most possibilities I mean even kind of listening to everyone and the kind of styles they play and their background there are just so many possibilities um I have a feeling something all pianists have in common is we like to work by ourselves maybe a little <laughs> so there might be there might be a don't little expose bit of... us like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think yeah for me it's it's just it's just the music it has the most beautiful music in the world so it's very mm -hmm. satisfying I would chime in and say that uh for me it's also the music that kind of propelled me into it um particularly jazz particularly Bill Evans mm -hmm. was the pianist that really got me really spoke to me uh, in the beginning and at the same time I was in college and what was easily accessible is these practice rooms so I was able to easily go into a practice room and you know, I didn't have to go buy an instrument. I just had to just push my fingers down. And, and then so it was just, for me, it was the ease of just being able to get into it pretty easily without a teacher. I didn't have a teacher at the time either. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, the music for sure. Falling in yeah. love. With yeah, absolutely. For, for me, like, this is going to sound really funny and you're all going to laugh at me, but Vanessa Carlton, I think that's all I have to say. <laughs> um, that first like that first lick in a thousand miles was like the reason I wanted to learn piano hundred percent. I don't know if anyone else has had that experience. <laughs> I think with me, hilariously enough, the only like the only reason I initially had that interest was the fact that I got bought a Barbie keyboard for Christmas and it was the coolest thing in the world. And I don't know where it went, but I really want it back. Um, Amazing. <laughs> and I was just like, I, I was, even though it was like a little toy keyboard, I was so amazed that I could just like, um, I think Delta was saying, just press a few notes. And I had a little tune there and I was like, well, this is cool. Like, I like this, I'm gonna progress with this. So yeah, Barbie keyboard over here, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. For me, when I was young, I started out with um, like group music classes and we were all put on recorder so that maybe later on we would go and learn flute. But nice. I absolutely hated the recorder because I couldn't breathe. Like I had to think about breathing all the time. And then I saw the like other side of the room that there was a piano and I was like, I don't have to think about breathing with that <laughs> piano yet. So then I got attached onto that. Obviously when I started studying deeper, I was like, oh, I actually do have to breathe with the phrase of the yeah. music. But when you're starting out, it's like, I don't have to feel like I'm dying all the time. <laughs> oh yeah. Do you ever find that like, like, I don't know if this ever happened to anybody else, but like when you're in the middle of a piece and then you're like at the very end, you're like, 
<gasps> I forgot to breathe the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> it's happened yeah, to me. I, I got told so by my times. high school music teacher that I held my breath when I played Bach. Pretty oh, yeah. So I think it's like something with concentration and forgetting to breathe there. So that's, yeah, something I, I think we yeah. have to watch out for. Well, and I've, I've also been told that like it, it helps to, it helps to put in a little breath when you need to, when you're trying to focus on your phrasing. And it's like, how do you, how do you convey musicality in music? It's like, well, you pretend you're a vocalist and mm-hmm. you, and you breathe with it, which is really cool. And I mean, I think we've all, uh, we've all been there with recorders. So I feel you, Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so actually that leads me beautifully into my next question, which I wanted to know for you guys specifically, I mentioned my favorite already, <laughs> but, uh, I wanted to know for all of you guys, what's your, who's your favorite pianist and why? Oh, big question. Yeah. <laughs> Loaded question. I don't know if I can name just one. It's a challenge for sure. <laughs> oh, I would say that for me, I, I did kind of mention it before it was, uh, it was Bill Evans who, uh, who does he's a jazz pianist from the 40s 50s 60s and on to the 80s mm-hmm. but played with miles davis played with some of the, the greatest musicians ever um but there's just something about the emotion that lived within his sound that really spoke to me at that time and from there i, I went on to a ton of other pianists like herbie hancock and uh, keith jarrett was another one of my favorites as well uh, but yeah, that is a very tough question because each one of these has a different quality. Each one of these musicians has a different uh, quality or like I, I fell in love with them and, you know, got sucked into their discog- discography um, at a different times. And so like, yeah, it's kind of a tough question for sure. Yeah. Like each one, each one kind of holds like a different, a different place in your heart, depending on what kind of music you were listening to at the time. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. Mm. It's tied to that. It's tied to that memory, that moment for sure. Yeah. It's certainly hard to pick. Yeah, I, I don't think I can pick an actual pianist. Like, I'm a bit like what you said with the Vanessa Carlton um, song. Like, I remember hearing The Scientist by Coldplay, which obviously is a super, like, basic piano intro when I was younger. And I was like, I want to be able to play that. I think I can play that. I'm going to give it a go. And I just, even though it's, like, so simple, those sort of, those, just those, that chord, them, the chords on the intro of that just hooked me. And from that, I think the simplicity, again, I'm a big fan of Ludovico Einaudi. Uh, and Jan Tiersen and Yaruma, that sort of those more basic pieces around just these chords. Like I'm a big chord reader. I don't read that much bass clef. Um, mm-hmm. And having those chords and kind of seeing the music vertically and then these pretty melodies on top. And I think it was definitely the, like Coldplay, the scientist. I think it was that that drew me in, which is hilarious because of all the styles <laughs> I play now. But yeah, it's funny what draws you in. <laughs> yeah. And, and Camilla, because you you uh you're obviously like you're more into like the the classical like the that kind of music and so it's interesting that nicole you mentioned that you're a chord reader because i'm like very much similar um i sucked at like reading music um but camilla i'm interested to know what what's been your experience like who is like if you had to pick like one of your favorite uh musicians or pianists who would you who would you choose yeah i think what popped out when you asked the question was a a portuguese pianist uh named maria joa pires who I think it was one of those experiences too. When I was a teenager, I had one of our CDs of Chopin Nocturnes and just listened to it kind of nonstop and just was so, I don't know, entranced by her playing. Um, and actually a couple of years ago, I got to see her perform all the Nocturnes at a, at a concert, a late night concert in London, which was just kind of magical and really <laughs> inspiring. Um, and I, I almost met her. My friend played a concert with her and afterwards asked if I wanted to come meet her backstage and I was just I was so shy and overwhelmed that I said no um so I hope I get a chance someday you know to tell her but I think yeah she's one of my favorites just for her sensitivity and artistry and just general loveliness Mm-hmm. that's really cool you'll have to uh you have to link us uh link us to her page and we'll check her out because oh, yeah. that sounds oh, really yeah. cool also the fact that you're just like she's my idol but I'm too scared like I totally <laughs> yeah. I feel not, that not in my, I feel that in my heart. I'm, <laughs> oh my God, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> She's one of my favorite pianists as well. I find her like playing to be very, um, I guess like spiritual mm-hmm. compared mm-hmm. to some other of the classical pianists. And I'm a little bit jealous and envious that you're able to listen to her because I think she like retired recently from the performance. Yeah, scene, and I haven't yeah, I had the chance to hear her different. live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> 
Well, for me, I, I kind of go into like phases of who I like. So mm-hmm. I'm kind of in a Daniil Trifonoff phase right now. So he's a classical pianist, but his uh, virtuosity and like the intensity of his playing and the ability to just kind of take over a whole hall with his emotion and just like getting past the floodlights and stuff, I think is really amazing and something I really admire about him. So I would say he's my favorite pianist for now until I move on to my next phase. (laughs) Until your next favorite pianist. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's amazing. Um, I have a question for you guys about um, when you're actually creating your own original music and not just playing someone else's music on the piano. So what is your process like when you do or if you do um, write original music on a piano? Take us kind of through where you start and kind of to where you end with your creative process. It's also a very large question. It's a very, because uh, again, we ask all, the hard questions here on the round table. <laughs> there's so many ways. There's so many, there's not, there isn't just one process, at least for me. Yeah. Um, and it depends if I'm playing solo piano, if I'm playing something with a beat. Um, and so typically, if I want to create something with um, a rhythm or a beat, uh, a drum section, I would actually create the drums first. Honestly, honestly it, it, it varies. It honestly, it varies. Uh, sometimes I'll create the drums first and that rhythm will lead me to chord changes that uh, might sound good. And from the chord changes, I'll, I'll find a riff or a melody. Um, and then the other way around, if I'm playing solo piano, um, I'll be honest with you, occasionally, even sometimes I'll take chords. Like I, I once took a, a Justin Bieber song, figured out the, the chord changes and created something completely not sounding like Justin Bieber mm. um, from it. And so there's, there's so many different ways of kind of uh, uh, finding the creativity. Uh, and then other times I'm just walking down the street and I hear something in my head and I'm just like, oh, that sounds good. And I'll, I'll record it into a voice recorder and from there I'll take it home and, and try to develop that. Oh yeah, I've done that where I'm like driving and then I'm like, Siri, open voice memos. And then you're like in the middle of something, you're like, da, 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 da. You just like got to sing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So um, I, I'm actually just starting a little bit of composition, so I'm kind of curious to listen to what the rest of you guys say. And I don't know, if Michelle, if you if you felt this, but in, in classical music, you're definitely either kind of considered a performer or a composer, and maybe there's not so much overlap. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've tried to do some collaborations. Um, I worked with two visual artists last year, and part of that was kind of creating my own music that they would then base their work on. So that was a really interesting process to kind of do something that was a little bit scary. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, for that, leaned a lot on um, enjoying improvising, which I do. I've studied some jazz and generally like to sit down at the piano and just mess around for a little bit. So I kind of took that as a starting point and just tried to find sounds that I liked and then went from there. But it's, it's definitely something that feels really new and exciting but it's it's very easy kind of the self-doubt when you're used to working towards you know perfecting a piece and like working with composers and having them give you music the the thought of going from a performer to someone who's also creating music is Mm -hmm. it's a really different feeling yeah well and I I find that that's a that's a thing in class in the classical world is you're one or the other like you can't be both Mm -hmm. for some reason which is very strange to me that's such Mm -hmm. a a strange thing because you know you can't have music without the composer right and you can't be a composer without performing. So it just, that's, that's such a crazy thing, but that's, that's amazing that you're doing that. Um, and I, I totally respect and admire that, uh, that way of approaching songwriting or just like sitting down and just playing with sounds that you like. I think that's such a beautiful way of, of songwriting. I think it's definitely important to like, I completely understand what you were saying um, about the performer and the comp the composer, they're seen as two different things, but, um, I like, I think because I'm not necessarily classical myself, I um, quite easily managed to break out of that. So I studied composition at music college, but I actually perform piano. Um, But it wasn't until my third year of music college that some of the tutors and some of even my friends realized that I was a pianist because they were just like, Mm. but you're a composer. And I was like, but I'm also a pianist. Like we can be both. And they were like, oh my God. (laughs) So I think it's really great that people are starting to to do both those things because like you were saying, how do you have performance without the composition and and vice versa? And I think 
as also another thing you were saying is it is really hard when you focus, especially with the classical side of things. Because I did do classical for a while, but it just wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. I just, I can't, I'm terrible with bass clef, as I said. Um, but I think with that, you're perfecting a piece, perfecting a piece, and then it comes to composition. And that's about making the mistakes and being a bit rough around the edges. And it's so hard. You kind of have to put on your composer hat or your performance hat. And it's, it's tough. Yeah, I completely understand where you're coming from there. Mm -hmm. I can definitely vouch for that as a classical pianist. Like, it's very much you're in the stream of composing or you're in the stream of performing. So for me, my composition skills are very limited. Um, and I would like to explore more now that I kind of have more time because of COVID mm -hmm. than I am looking into like more jazz and stuff and just like improvising, finding the sounds that I like on the piano. And I find maybe this might be true for like beginners like me. I find um, having lyrics really helps you find a melody because it helps you give you rhythm and so it kind of is all one combined package and then from there you kind of add a chord progression underneath although mm -hmm. I know sometimes for me it might be easier that I find a chord progression I like and that kind of gives me hints to what I want with the melody yeah well and it's it's interesting with with that style of uh with that style of, of music, it's, I always find it interesting where you can kind of take a lyric and turn it into something there. Mm -hmm. Um, and do you ever find like, because you teach, um, with, uh, with like the classical stuff and trying to, trying to teach that composition I find is also really interesting. Um, but actually one more thing really quick, we do have less than a minute on zoom. So mm -hmm. what we're going to do is we're going to end the call. We're going to keep this conversation going. Cause Michelle, I have a question for you and I don't want to forget it. Okay. So we're going to keep this going. We're going to end the call. I'll resend you guys the link and we're just going to keep this going. So we will be back in like just a second. All right. Yay. Yeah. There Sorry we go. That, We're back, everybody. <laughs> uh, so to continue this conversation, uh, Michelle, I wanted to ask you about uh, when you're doing your composition, uh, specifically when you're teaching, um, do you ever like sit down with a student and kind of explain a little bit of like, do you ever like analyze a piece and sit down and talk about like, okay, this is why this chord is here. This is why this is here. Um, do you ever kind of sit down and do that? Or do you find that you struggle with it being kind of new to composition yourself? Um, as a classical pianist, and I teach like classical music, mm -hmm. the more advanced that you get with music, the more that you actually do rely on the chord progressions and analyzing the theory to get deeper understanding of how the phrases go. So with my advanced students, I do teach them uh, theory and stuff. And then I show them in the music how that works and how it happens like in real life mm -hmm. to get a better understanding. So I don't find I have too much trouble with that, so long as the student is receptive to that form of education. Mm. I see. Well, that's really cool. Um, I, yeah, I think it definitely works better with, with older students for sure. And, and, uh, yeah, younger students, you're just like trying to get them to stop doing. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that was a thing in Canada as well. I thought that was just a thing here. I can't believe that's a worldwide thing. <laughs> thing everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, okay. So um, yeah, I think we're finished with that question. So Marissa, yeah, 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 yeah. The next one. Yeah. So, uh, so basically my, my, I mean, kind of going off of what I, what I was just saying, um, I know that I have like, I, I have a very specific kind of like practice routine and, and daily warm up routine. Um, and I know like all of you guys are very, uh, into piano and you play it very, very often. Um, so specifically I wanted to know, like, what are some of your favorite exercises that you guys do that are kind of like your go-tos and, and why do you go to those exercises? Mm, I, my warm up with Brahms exercises. <laughs> um, they're all about kind of getting flexible, using all of the muscles. Um, and I try to pass it on to my, my advanced students. So it's fun to kind of teach um, that and scales. <laughs> scale, <laughs> scale, thing, scale, yeah. scales. <laughs> yeah, scales are always good for you. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, I totally get that too. Like I, I remember when I first started teaching, um, I, I like sucked at piano, like Nicole, when you say like you sucked at bass clef, I don't think you quite understand how badly I was, why I was at bass clef, <laughs> but I get it. Um, but yeah, so like when I first started teaching piano, I was, uh, or when I first started teaching voice, um, I had to learn how to do like those like pentascales and like full major scales, minor scales, but I had to do them in like half steps for the vocalists to like warm them up. And I remember it was like the hardest thing ever. Like my poor vocal students, the first year I was teaching, I feel so bad for them. Um, but now just because of that, like I'm, I'm really good at doing like half steps. I can play any scale you want in any key you want. Just tell me what key you want it in. Um, I yeah, don't know if I anyone's ever had that experience too. The first time I, I worked with a choir and I'd never done it before, but obviously I said that I had, you know, several times. Uh, but I remember 
learning like really quickly how to warm vocalists up and how to do it by half steps and prepare it but I definitely faked it for the first couple of days and they definitely noticed <laughs> but I think you can catch up after a little bit mm-hmm. yeah for yeah. sure I think with me because I'm as, as I've been saying not that classical I'll obviously do um scales and arpeggios as like if I'm feeling a bit heavy handed that day, I'll do that to kind of flex and um, add that flexibility a little bit. But one of my favorite things to do before I sit down, actually start working properly on a project or an arrangement or a new piece is I like to just like pop my Spotify on shuffle or the Amazon Alexa on shuffle and um, put a song on and literally sit and figure it out by ear. And I try and force myself to, by the end of the song, be able to play along well with it. Cause I find that really improves um, like ear overall technique that's the word I was looking for mm-hmm. um so yeah like that's kind of I, I don't know if that's such as a warm-up technique but that's definitely a technique I try and use just to kind of get me in the in the zone a little bit and picking out the different layers of the song so that's cool I like that I like that way of uh of doing that like with the with the exercises then like turning on Spotify that's really cool I don't know if it's cool I feel like it's kind of nerdy but it works so it's okay <laughs> Absolutely. I wouldn't say that's nerdy. I'd say that's it's actually great. It's actually a really good uh, technique to to uh, develop your ear for sure. I, I do you the same. Thing. Try it. <laughs> yeah, I do it. I do it as well. Uh, actually, ah. the the other thing that I like to do is um, I'll take you know once I do figure out the chord changes on a song, for example, I'll uh, I'll play the chords in the left hand and then run through the scale that works with that chord. Mm. as I'm changing this. So the scale's changing as well as the left hand. So as I'm going through the chord changes, I'm basically going through the different scales that pertain to each each chord. Mm. I kind of have to like show you to show you to make for it to make sense, but um, it's it's cool and it's actually really it's kind of challenging because you're having to switch the scale that you're playing on your right hand every time you're changing the chord. And so it, it gets it can be a little chal- challenging sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Michelle, I saw you. I saw you like nodding your head along. Um, I mean, you have your piano there. Can you like show us an exercise? I, I'm not going to put you on the spot. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You don't I have just to. Remember, I was remembering my days where I was like trying to try, like self teach myself jazz. Mm-hmm. It's just nice. You'll oh. play like a chord. You have to figure out which like scale goes well with it. Mm-hmm. So I was just having some. I was like, yes, I used to do that, and it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're sitting there and you're just like, okay, D flat low Korean. What do I play? Like, yeah, hundred percent. It's a little bit like just like astrophysics. And you're just like, what keys am I supposed to use? What key am I in? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, do I go to the five of the five? What key am I in? A flat. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been there so many times before. Um, yeah, it's and it's also like kind of super fun to just like dive into stuff that way of just like, I'm going to play this random chord and be like, okay, now what works with this? It's kind of like an interesting mm-hmm. ear exercise too. Absolutely. For myself, I, when I, after I had that little jazz kind of phase for myself, um, I usually, my re- warm up routine is very different. It depends on what I'm having to do and practice that day or my general mood. Um, sometimes I like warming up with like just sight reading. Because as a classical pianist, sometimes mm. you just get music thrown at you. You're like, I need you to accompany me tomorrow. So your like sight reading has to be quite high up there. So I like to keep that up. Um, Brahms exercises, I really love as well. And yeah, and um, Chopin etudes, or sometimes I just make up my own exercises depending on whatever my piece requires as a kind of getting into that mode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. Um, what do you, I know we kind of touched on this, Michelle, a little bit, and you said about your, your injury, actually. So I actually want to ask all of you, um, how do you prevent injury from playing an instrument over and over and over? I know for myself, we've been uh, picking back up on our live streaming as COVID's kind of been settling down. So I have now intense uh, guitar wrist pain because I have not been practicing and warming up properly. Um, yeah. So Michelle, can you actually start us off and just let us know kind of maybe some ways that you recovered or ways that you guys in general have um prevented injury from this type of excessive playing um well i learned all of mine after i got injured so yeah. <laughs> Don't as we were we just talking about <laughs> i know right um one of the things is the most important thing is to like warm up as a mm-hmm. pianist no matter what level you're at you're basically an athlete of like the fine motor control 
And there isn't an athlete out there who's like, well, I'm going to run my five miles. Let's go early in the morning. Like they warm up a little bit, get limbered. So you have to do that, whether it's just some easy scales or like go for a run, get the blood going. Mm -hmm. Um, Don't play things over and over and over and over again for an hour straight. Because you weren't running a marathon, like a five kilometer marathon over and over and over again every day. Mm -hmm. So do take breaks. I usually set a timer, like after 20, 25 minutes, I need to like get up, go do something, come back. And it's Mm -hmm. good for the brain too. And um, stretches, do some stretches in between to like get your, you know, all the good stuff, your shoulders, (laughs) things like that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. And how about for the rest of you? What are some ways you're prevented injury or maybe just like an experience you've had with an injury with piano or an instrument? Yeah. So I would say I've I've had my fair share of injuries, especially from not playing piano, from, from actually moving them. Yeah, but, I was gonna say I've I've actually I've actually been following your Instagram like for like since I got Instagram I like followed your Instagram so when you're doing this piano thing I was like we need to message him, um because like I've been I've been following you for like a long time, uh and yeah like you you carry that piano around with you like everywhere like ha- like you must yeah. be like so ripped like <laughs> lugging that giant I, well, piano everywhere I just I stopped traveling with the piano because honestly I got I got burnt out because mm-hmm. I mean I started to question like. Um, you know, it goes back to the idea of like, what is my ideal life? What is my dream life? And it's not moving pianos, that's for sure. It's playing piano. So I, I actually stopped traveling with it because I kind of got burnt out. Uh, but also I had a ton of injuries. Um, mm-hmm. There was a time in the beginning, it was 2010 when I first started off, where a piano actually fell on my hand and I, I broke, if I could show you, I broke, oh wait, where's my hand? There it is. This finger, you can oh, see. Oh no. I broke the oh, tip of this finger. And that, yeah, so that was like 10 years ago. I can still play and everything's pretty good, I guess. But um, really, I, I, I have had injuries in terms of, uh, I developed carpal tunnel. And there was a period of time, this is from playing the piano, mm-hmm. probably also because of uh, from pushing as well. But um, I went to the doctor and he said, oh, you have carpal tunnel. And, you know, doctors honestly didn't help at all. Um, so what I had to do is I had to like kind of explore and observe and, and really figure out what's wrong with me. I, I actually couldn't play piano for eight months. And so what I did was um, just started to really observe. And what I realized was that the problems that I was having actually were not in the carpal tunnel, which is right here in the wrist, but mm. actually in my shoulder, this compression that they talk mm. about. And so what I found out was that the same nerve, the carpal tunnel, the, uh, uh, the vagus nerve, I think it's called, that runs from here from your carpal tunnel all the way through your elbow and through your shoulder. So I found out that that I'm actually having problems in this area. And so I started doing these stretches. I started doing these opening stretches. I'm doing this demonstration. (laughs) I started doing these like opening arm stretches, right? Open up my shoulder blades Mm -hmm. and doing shoulder rolls and stuff like that. And in a matter of like a month and a half, all this pain just went away. But now I, I continuously do this on a regular basis um, another thing that uh, led me to this discovery was that I was sleeping on my side. So I was sleeping on my side, kind of like in a closed position, and I'd wake up and I have numbness in my wrists. Mm-hmm. I realized, ah, that's that's interesting. That that's um, I realized that oh man, maybe I'm having some problem over here with my shoulders. Yeah. Um, well, so it's it, stretching is is very 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 yeah. important. Well, it's because everything in your body is connected, right? Like you could have a problem in your in your back, and then it'll affect your knees. Like mm-hmm. it's yeah right yeah it's, fully it's, get that I think stretching 100% like obviously it's a bit different um what I do in the hotels it's like they and, and weddings and stuff they really expect you they don't sometimes realize that we are people they're like you're a machine you're a musician like yeah. I've had people say to me well you can play for two three hours without taking a break and I'm like I, I can't but I, I, I have made the mistake of, of at the start of my career especially saying yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And I think the longest, I mean, um, the actual longest I did was earlier in lockdown, I did a 10 hour live stream where I didn't stop playing. I stopped to like have a drink and chat to people. It was all on Facebook Live. It was raising money for the hospitals here for the NHS. But apart from, and that was fine. I didn't mind hurting for that because that was a good cause. But in the hotels, when people say to you or at weddings, oh, you can play for a couple of hours without taking a break, I'll say now I'm like, I can't because I will ache for days. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter yeah. how many stretches I do. If you're sat like this 
and by after an hour or so I think we all agree we're kind of like this you know um you're in a lot of pain and you're walking around like the hunchback for the next yeah. few days so I was gonna say I just think- you telling that story like my forearms are on fire just thinking about <laughs> yeah. that oh yeah it was it was like because it was for NHS it was for a great cause and at mm-hmm. the start of coronavirus we were I think every country's um hospital system was very overwhelmed by the mm-hmm. pandemic so it was okay but I did like I got off and I just I cried because from here to here oh. was just in agonizing pain but yeah like I think the stretches before any gig that I do like you were saying with the shoulders and the arms and people see you and they're like you're okay like you're not about to do a sport and I'm like but it kind of is I know it's a sport really, it is. Yeah. why don't you try playing for 10 hours and you tell me how you feel <laughs> <sighs> yeah absolutely. oh man uh well and that it's it's such a crazy thing like how how injuries are just like so normal for musicians that everyone's like, yeah, I got carpal tunnel. Like, yeah, I got tendonitis. Everyone's like, uh, yeah, me too, man. Like it's, it's hilarious, but also like kind of sad. Um, so I wanted to, to ask you guys specifically kind of getting into, I guess this is part of it is sometimes people get injured and they kind of stop playing for a while. Um, but specifically I wanted to know what do you guys think causes most people to quit piano uh, when they're, when they start to play and Camilla, I'm very interested to know your answer here. Cause I know that you're, uh, you do a lot of work in, uh, diversity within, uh, classical music. And, and, uh, so I'm, I'm interested to know your answer to this question. Do you, do you mean, uh, music students or professionals? Yeah. Music students or professionals or anybody yeah. that you've had experience with. I'm just, I'm curious to know anybody's opinion. Uh, uh but Camilla, I want to start with you. Yeah. All right. Um, thinking of, uh, my students, I, I always find when they, if I've had them for a while, when they become teenagers, maybe they find other interests and sometimes I, I lose them. Mm-hmm. Um, there've been a few students who have gone through phases of not wanting to play piano, but I think that they're so talented. I, I, you know, I try to reach out to their parents and, you know, try to engage them and, you know, maybe they've gotten bored of practicing or maybe they're not good at organizing their time. Um, but at the same time, like I, I really appreciate that, um, you know, becoming a musician isn't for everyone and not, it shouldn't really be a goal for everyone. I think any time you spend learning a musical instrument or engaging with music gives you so many tools for the future. So with a lot of my students, you know, I'm sad to see them go when they quit, but I think about how much they've gained from, from music lessons and kind of how much armor they built around themselves kind of going forward and you know, being disciplined and expressing themselves and things like that. Yeah. So yes, it's kind of a, it's, it's bittersweet when, when people quit piano um, or quit music, but you just hope that it'll be something that at least has touched their lives for the the amount of time they've done it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that idea of, uh, of like the armor that they've built up. uh, Cause I think a lot of us forget that you know, music gives us a whole different skill set that I think we don't actually realize we use in everyday life, like, yeah. like routine, discipline, uh, you know, just listening to music, enjoying music and like rhythm and all this stuff is, is stuff that we learn. I like that idea of armor. I'm going to use that from now on. I like that. <laughs> I, I, I took it from that. a teacher. Yeah. A teacher said it to me and I was like, oh, that's a good one. I, like I don't it. know. I think it's, it's really true. I mean, I, I've gotten so much out of out of music, just in terms of my my own personal journey and development, and and I love the fact that as musicians we can share that with other people. I mean, even with kind of audiences and anyone we can kind of inspire through music, it's yeah. I know that's kind of kind of the joy, I guess, and part of our what makes all of the practice and and hard work worth it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the best way to make friends, that's for sure. <laughs> Go play music on the streets. I guarantee you'll make like 10 years. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, I, I really did LA once. <laughs> like I found a I found an antique shop that let me practice um in their store on their upright piano, but then they asked if I could go out in the street and I made so many friends in the neighborhood. Like yeah, yeah it was awesome. I love what you're doing as well, Camilla, with the, I'm not sure about it. I'm definitely going to look into it more after mm-hmm. this chat, um, what you're doing with your charity, because mm-hmm. I find obviously I I do teach a little bit online, but that's not my main thing. My main thing is more the performing at the events. And I know like um, sometimes being a woman, solo musician, like I've had comments like she's not going to be able to play that. Why isn't a man doing that job? I assume the man, I assume the pianist today would be a male and you're not and it's just like 
little comments like that have forced oh, really yeah. talented musicians to quit. So it's what you're doing is fantastic. Like, mm -hmm. I can't wait to look into everyone's journeys on this chat, but like, I can't wait to look into that. It's so great. So thank you oh, for doing well, that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, now that I know all of you guys, I'm probably gonna ask you to play for Music for Liberia at some time. It's just, it's a fun way to connect with musicians. And yeah, like you said, I mean, it's, being a musician comes with so much kind of self-doubt and, and rejection, etc. Mm -hmm. So, anything you can do to kind of empower fellow musicians. And I've, I've always found music kind of funny in being competitive and non-competitive. I mean, it is competitive because there's so many talented people and we're all trying to go after these, you know, opportunities and projects. But at the same time, it's such, it can be such a supportive community. And, you know, that's part of what I love about doing music for Liberia is just is meeting other musicians who are, you know, passionate about giving or passionate about, you know, expressing their creativity in a, in a new different way um so yeah i'm actually i'm curious about that if i can mm -hmm. uh just how other how you guys have found kind of the competitive nature of, of being a musician mm -hmm. sorry to steal a question from you guys. no that's oh, perfect i yeah. was that yeah that actually makes a lot of uh sense of, of where we were going so i was like yeah i want to talk about this because it's <laughs> it's such an interesting topic because like i i find personally for me that um, at least where we are in Edmonton, it's a very uh, uplifting kind of community where we're all, we're not really like in competition with each other. We're not really tearing each other down. The competition really comes from like, okay, how can I make myself better? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't, I don't know how it is where, where all of you guys are like Michelle, Nicole, Dotan, uh, Camilla. Um, but yeah, fair question. Uh, I, I want to know a little bit more about that too. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, Camilla, you uh, you kind of were asking about um, uh, about kind of how competition, how how music is both competitive and non-competitive. So I've just found that with just it being in a really supportive community, but one where everyone's going after the same competitions or projects. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I identify with what you said, Marissa. Just a lot of it comes from yourself, like musicians put a lot of pressure on themselves you're always trying to better yourself you're trying to stand out um yeah it's it's just a it's a strange it's a strange kind of opposition mm -hmm. I do find that to be kind of true as a classical pianist and um studying classical performance in university we're trying to support each other and you know you play for each other but with our art it's very there's a lot of perfectionism in the music so you end up being highly critical of both yourself and other people. And then I find that there's that weird balance thing that happens where you want to be supportive of someone else, like at a performance or something, mm. but there's that inner critic that is always either beating you down or beating that person down. And then it starts to get competitive and you think, how mm. can I do better? What can I do better? What are they doing that I'm not? And then there's that, again, that weird mix of being non-competitive, but also being competitive at the same time, Yeah, which I think is weird for art because art is just self-expression there's no right there's no wrong it shouldn't be competitive but somehow we've kind of turned it into that yeah mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah or we're it. yeah where everybody thinks that they like if they're gonna go into music that means they have to be the best at it or like if they're gonna do music that means they have to be an amazing musician it's like no you can just do it just to enjoy it you don't have to yeah. be in it for that reason um that's a really good point that you brought up too it's like that kind of inner thing of like why do we immediately go to tear each other down mm -hmm. yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I completely get that. Like, I think with me, as I said, like started with classical and I was good at it. Like I was okay at it. Uh, my heart definitely wasn't in it. And then I kind of, I kept seeing and meeting these other incredible classical pianists. And I just kind of thought one day I was like, I'm never going to be as good as them at classical. Like, why am I trying to be a classical pianist when my interests do lie elsewhere and the way I got like I kind of coaxed myself out of that competitive almost jealous as awful as it sounds mindset was okay focus on what you do focus on that little box of what you do and just go for that and like run down that path and see how that goes and and that's still to this day how like because obviously we all scroll through Facebook Instagram we're like wow these guys are incredible like all through lockdown people are doing all these projects you're like wow I, I could do that but then I'm like right that's their thing. They're great at it. And that's really cool. You do your thing and you be great at that because mm -hmm. like, it's kind of that jack of all trades, master of one thing, isn't it? You yeah. know, so that's how I dealt with it personally. 
Yeah. Mm. That's a really great way to mindfully like check yourself in. And I think a lot of us have to do that. And I sometimes myself, if I am doing that comparison, I just literally throw my phone and I'm like, nope, not doing that. Like I'm absolutely not <laughs> contributing to that. Like I'm off my phone for the next, you know, hour or two until, and then eventually, you know, you get yourself out of that funk. So it's just, yeah, really tapping in and asking yourself these questions. Like you said, Nicole, of like, why do I need to compare myself? I'm doing exactly what I'm doing. So we have a few more questions before we wrap up here, but my next question is kind of, I guess, similar to what we were chatting about, but, um, do you guys believe that piano is well presented or not presented enough in popular music nowadays? So this could really be any genre, but do you think like, obviously when we compare the time of like Bach, piano was like, that was like the bop in time. But now in 2020, do you think that piano is being represented well enough or do you think we need a little bit more representation and more piano players to kind of boost up more in our, in our music? Yeah. That's a really good question. Because <laughs> back in the day, Mozart was like, are you ready for some unreleased stuff? And everyone's like, woo! <laughs> that you'll never hear again. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, Nicole mentioned some composers that are popular that people really connect to. And yeah. I've had a lot of students who start playing piano because they want to play the Amelie soundtrack or mm. they want to play La La Land etc which is you know a great starting point <laughs> um so for me I, at least with my students and even even when I'm in Liberia I, it's just amazing what music gets there and how many mm. people want to learn the piano when I'm when I'm there and how much it's part of the culture even though it's it's a western instrument um so I think I think I'm pretty happy with the representation of piano in in pop culture I think it's just an instrument that it's so impressive that it really inspires and moves people when they see it. And there's so much music. I think the way we were talking about earlier in the discussion, there's so much music and such a diverse array of music for people to latch onto. Um, so I think, yeah, once you're, once you kind of hear your, your music, I think that'll be it. And then there's a whole world to explore. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And Dotan, you were, you were also, uh, wanted to jump in there on mm -hmm. top of what, uh, Camilla was saying. What, what did you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, interesting. After after hearing what Camilla said, um, I think about the uh, just the arts in America, and I think it's completely not appreciated. I think the arts are very underappreciated in America, and this is just my opinion. I could be completely wrong. Um, at least growing up here in New York, um, I think you know the arts are like the first thing that gets cut mm -hmm. from budgets, and so. In thinking about that, and I think about Europe after, you know, I've been to Europe, I've traveled around Europe, I play music on the streets in Europe, and the way people appreciate it there, uh, it's just so much different than here. What's even funnier is I'll play, I'll be playing piano on the streets in New York, and I'll get more appreciation from the tourists than, than I do from the locals. I don't know, I just think it's uh, the mindset, uh, here I'm, I'm getting critical of American culture, but I don't know, I think, uh, I think piano and music is very underappreciated here uh, mm -hmm. compared to other places, particularly yeah. Europe and maybe even Canada. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, going a little bit backwards towards your question, uh, I'm not very much, a, I'm not really a pop guy, but I mean, occasionally you see, you know, Lady Gaga playing piano or like mm -hmm. Justin Bieber. And, and, and it's definitely, you see it, it's represented, but it's not, um, I would say since Bach, piano has been kind of going down. It's not as cool, I guess. It's not and that's kind cool. of my like mission as it was to like, piano is not that cool, but like, I want to make piano cool. I want to, I want to make it like a cool thing. And that's mm -hmm. why I kind of did what I, what I did is to kind of make it cool through my lens, through how I see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Well, and it, it's funny that you bring up that like we want to make piano cool again, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I remember one of my students came to me and was like, I want to play this song. Uh, and then he like, he was like, I want to play, I'm still standing. I was like, you mean the John Elton song? I was like, aren't you like seven? And he's like, no, I heard it. I heard the gorilla played and sing. And I was like, oh, so that was a, uh, that's, that's kind of cool. And I, it, it is kind of coming back in those ways of just like these little things, I guess maybe it's just the nostalgia culture that's going on right now. Just all the, all the millennials have grown up and now we're like, okay, we want to play our favorite songs again. Um, but uh, Michelle and, and uh, Nicole, I'm interested to know what your guys' opinions is on that. Uh, whether you think piano is, is still uh, in today's culture as much as it, as it was before. 
Um, you go. You guys. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> I'm also like not as in tune with the pop culture because I'm a classical pianist, but I also am really into K-pop. If you guys know what mm -hmm. K-pop is, <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. So I I find like K-pop doesn't have a lot of piano scenes, and if it is piano being played in the music video, it's usually relegated to being like the sappy ballads. And the crying mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. like they're dancing on the piano and I'm like please don't do that <laughs> <laughs> so I find like compared I guess to box times box times when a piano was like the instrument I would say in my experience of my own version of the musical world um piano kind of gets relegated to being like a tool a tool for producing music mm -hmm. a tool for being a cover of another piece but it's mm -hmm. not like here's a pop song that I'm playing the piano on and it originated from the piano like I had that composed in mind right mm. so I guess that would be my two cents mm -hmm. that's a great point I never thought about it that way you're absolutely right yeah I like that <laughs> yeah Thanks. I think obviously um just to follow on that from what Michelle said like it is with with pop music especially like there are so many singers like everyone is a singer every band almost needs a singer mm -hmm. unless you're going to do film music or classical music and it's like why can't we have a pop song that's fronted by a guitarist or fronted by a pianist or fronted by someone playing the clarinet and everyone goes oh that's classical music and I'm like but it, it yeah. might not be like we could <laughs> develop that idea and I think definitely like I think we're all, as the generations go on and on, everything is becoming more creative and more breaking outside the box. And hopefully we'll have more of that um, because I think I completely agree with what Michelle was saying. It's kind of a tool or it's it's like an assistant, mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely got the capability. And there's so many amazing pianists out there to make it forefront and like, this is the piano and it's gonna lead some things. And obviously you can have that in classical music with an orchestra, but having that in, in the sort of popular music segment could be really interesting. And I think that's definitely something that has, you know, to be explored um so yeah but la la land i can't remember who mentioned la la land but i think that like my mum watched that and was like oh so this is what you do because ryan gosling's obviously playing in, in the bars and stuff and, and i was like yeah he's like, being portrayed in the film a little bit and um i think we can all like relate with that scene where he's playing really passionately and then he stands up and no one's listening and you're mm. like hey it's it's me <laughs> it's what yeah. I so i think that's Putting your own money like into that. the tip jar. Yeah. <laughs> Spoken for the best, getting by. But I think, yeah, I think more movies like that definitely needs, like, it's a really, it's an, I, I mean, I find it interesting because I'm a pianist, but I think it's a really cool thing. And um, yeah, we need to make it a little bit cooler again. And mm -hmm. hopefully as time goes by, we can, we can work on that. But there's a great generation of pianists right now mm -hmm. um, floating around on the internet or just performing on the street pianos, performing at venues. Like it's, it's not dead yet. We've got to bring mm -hmm. it back a little bit, I think. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. yeah. Well, that was our last question for the day. We are out of time, but we are so lucky to have each and every one of you on today. If you are all at home watching this roundtable with Vienna White on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell button so you can be notified about our shows. We do live shows Monday to Friday, and we also do live streaming music on there, so there's lots of uh, content to watch. If you want to hear this conversation via podcast, make sure to search up Vienna White Podcast, and there you will find it. Uh, I'm Millie Rouge, your host, and I want to thank my co-host, Marissa K for being on today. Marissa, where can you find our band on the internet? Uh, just get at us at Vienna White on Instagram. Vienna, like the city, white with a Y, because uh, we're trendy on Instagram. Awesome. You can find all of our stuff there. Now, for each of our guests, could I all get you all to once again say your stage name and then your social media of where you want our audience to find you. So Camilla, can we start off with you? Uh, hi, I'm Camilla Arku, a pianist and director of music for Liberia. You can find me at Camilla Pianist on Instagram and at Music for Liberia on Instagram. Um, we also have a concert coming up next Sunday with Madonna's Pianist. So that's really exciting. So watch out for that. Oh my gosh, so excited. <laughs> and Nicole, <laughs> can you sign yourself out? Hey, uh, thank you guys so much for having me and having all these great pianists. Um, I'm Nicole Reynolds. I'm on Facebook as pianist, uh, Nicole Reynolds, pianist and songwriter. I'm on Instagram as Piano Cole, and I'm also in a duo called Chelsea and Nicole. So you can find that on the social media too. Thanks guys. Fantastic. And Dotin, can you sign yourself out? Thanks again for having me as well. And my name is Dotan Negrin and you can find me on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and all social media at Piano Around. Thanks again. Awesome. And Michelle. 
Thank you so much for having me. And it's been wonderful speaking to all of you and just seeing all the different backgrounds related to piano. And so you can find me on Instagram, YouTube, or Facebook at The Open Score for my personal account or on my new channel called Two Sharps, One Flat. It's a fun channel on classical music with the number two sharps and the number one and then flat. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. We will see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>